you know what? We have to do this ourselves. Nothing had ever worked in my life until one day I said, I'm going to do this thing and take what was available to me, resources I actually had. That worked. And instead of being like, hey, that was a big life lesson. We're like, okay, now let's go back to holding our hands out and being like, will someone give us some money and help us? What the hell was I doing? Demystified is a production of Studio Fest. If you're ready to make a micro-budget feature, submit your film or screenplay now at filmfreeway.com slash studiofest. This episode of Demystified is brought to you by Armor Lock. This series exists in both video and podcast form, and is designed to be experienced either way. You can find the video version at moviemaker.com, or the audio version wherever you get your podcasts. From Studio Fest and Movie Maker Magazine, this is Demystified, a series about an innovative new way to make movies, and what it really takes to make an indie feature film. My name's Jake Bowen, and this series is about shedding light on the parts of getting an indie film made that are never seen and rarely talked about through the lens of Studio Fest, a one-of-a-kind annual film festival that awards up-and-coming writers and directors the chance to make a feature film. A few months ago, we got the chance to talk to Evan Glodell, one of the filmmakers we most wanted to talk to about the changing landscape of indie filmmaking. We've been framing these conversations around Mark Duplass's South By speech about how the cavalry isn't coming. And we talked to Evan about his experiences learning that lesson the hard way. And by the way, for an in-depth look at much of what we talk about in this episode, check out Coat Wolf's Movies and Machines docuseries. And now we bring you Independent Spirit Award nominated writer, director, and actor, Evan Glodell. I don't know. I grew up kind of all over, mostly in Wisconsin. I moved out to LA area when I was 20, 21, with the intent of getting involved in making movies somehow. And I didn't really know anything more than that plan. Very quickly realized it was a hard world to break into. And so I ended up making friends with other people from making short films, sometimes alone, sometimes with just my brother who moved out here with me. After years of that, we kind of collected a group of people and the goal was always to get a feature funded. They called their filmmaking collective Coat Wolf. Like our work was getting better and more polished and we thought we had a reel and things to show that maybe would somehow get us some, some sort of resources. I don't know where we thought we, they were coming from. Sometime around 2006, 2007, I realized it wasn't ever gonna happen. And we're gonna have to take a chance and pull every favor and do whatever it takes, run our lives into the ground and just make our first feature film with whatever we had. Or as he put it in the first episode of Movies and Machines. You don't get a movie funded. We're either just gonna make it or we're done. And so we made Bellflower. Who are you, where are you from, what do you do? Oh, um. Lord, we will be hurt. We'll be okay. Bellflower was made by a handful of volunteers on a true shoestring budget. That ended up taking three years and being kind of a wild roller coaster. And at the end, we thought we'd wasted our time and it was all for nothing because we didn't know what to do with the movie. And then through some kind of fluke in the universe, we got into Sundance. Bellflower premiered at Sundance 2011 and was nominated for a Spirit Award. And that was like the first positive reinforcement I had gotten personally as a filmmaker in 10 years of trying, of actively making things. I feel like that story is the one I was talking about 10 years ago when they were promoting Bellflower. Now there's been almost what, another nine years, another almost decade of a totally different story. I mean, there's two parallel stories that I lived the last decade. One was our crowdfunding project, which was really my friend's project that I was producing for the first time, not directing. The campaign for Chuck Hank and the San Diego Twins, directed by Coat Wolf member John Keevil, raised over $100,000 on Indiegogo. That was something that I was doing basically to keep all my friends and the people I work with busy. It was supposed to be a fun project while I was figuring out how to make my second film. And that's one story, but the one I'm talking about right now is me kind of staying on the path, getting my second film, Canary Made. We got into Sundance, all these people came out of the woodwork. I'm having meetings with like literally A-list actors who were like, I wanna work with you. And every big studio in town. And I was like, we fucking made it. Things are gonna work from now on. It is not even remotely close to what happened. Oh, this is weird stuff to talk about here, coffee. I feel like I have to say this is my experience and I feel like I can't even take myself out of the equation because why I wasn't able to get a film funded, I guess I don't really know. No one told me. 
you know, for years I was going to meetings nonstop. Like once you're in the door, you can do these things, you know, like you have an agency and you have contacts and you're like, all right, I got this thing I want to pitch to get funded. And you can get into pretty much every room in town from the major studios to the like big independent production companies. And a lot of these people had been regularly taking me out to dinner, inviting me to premieres and parties for some of them for, you know, a year or two regularly being like, we want to work with you. I finally came with something and I don't even know that you get an official no. So it was like at some point, you know, 20 meetings in, I started asking people like, Hey, look, this is the thing I'm doing and I'm not getting a good reaction. It would be like hugely appreciated if you could tell me what it is that scares you about this. And even asking people that seems like it makes them have a nervous breakdown. Like it's what people talk about in Hollywood that it's like when things are going good, people call you back. When things are not going good, they just disappear. They don't want to be like, fuck off. It's just not the way the town works. It was seven years of me consistently. Like this might sound crazy to someone who hasn't been through it, but it's not an exaggeration. Like if you had been close to me during those seven years, it's like me having meetings, talking to people, trying to figure out getting something going. And so many people said, no, we want to make a movie like Bellflower. Bellflower went to Sundance, it got Spirit Awards, it got a theatrical release, so everybody was talking about it. We want to make a movie like that. And I'm literally like, the script I had for this movie called Canary, when I look at it, it looks like a map. And the map is identical to Bellflower. Yes, you're in different locations with different characters, but as far as the way the story plays out and the style of it and everything, it's almost so similar to Bellflower that you should be embarrassed. But I guess it didn't have like a flaming muscle car in it. So they didn't see, this is a low budget project. You know, like people were offering me $40 million films to come on and direct if I want to come on to their project. But that's not why I make films. I make films because I have stories that I want to tell. And I'm like, if they're offering me $40 million films to direct, certainly I could get, you know, a million dollars or even a sub million dollar film funded, you know, if someone's take a chance on me. But it, 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 it just didn't play out that way. So, um, Seven years, meetings, reworking, shooting things, making new visual materials to explain the style and why I thought the movie was going to have value in the world, just since people didn't seem to be able to get it. And uh, nothing, like absolutely nothing. I, that's actually a lie. There was a couple times it almost went, but then it fell through. This is probably going to be a little assumptive and a weird question, but like... Uh-oh. <laughs> I know there are directors out there that do the one for me, one for them policy. Having been through this for a decade, has your outlook changed on that at all? Ooh, that's my, the one for me and one for them idea. You know, I definitely have thought about it. I had a number of people talking to me about coming on to direct larger budget films onto someone else's project after Sundance. And I said no, because I was like, I don't do this for money. And I have my story and I assumed that I would get my film funded. And if I would have known it would have taken seven years and that I would have gotten more money from doing one of those jobs that I ultimately raised, seven years later, obviously I would have done one of those jobs. But since at least for this moment, that ship has sailed, the ship may come back. Uh, but I don't think I would ever voluntarily do that unless like really somehow the subject matter of the project and the people who are doing it somehow aligned in some very unusual way. I'm in like kind of the opposite camp now or, where I'm like, I care so much about these stories. I want them to come first. So I would rather be working on a limited budget and be able to not get stuck and continue to, to output and create. Mm -hmm. And then if I made three movies this way and then we couldn't pay the rent at our shop here, you know, uh, I think I'd retire. I'd be like, well, this means the world doesn't need my stories. And then I, and I don't know that I'd even be that conflicted about it because that's honest. Like no, no one wants to do something that doesn't matter, you know? So doing one for me and one for them, theoretically, if I was a different kind of person and I thought I could interface with that more traditional system for a year or two, you know, make some friends, take some money, go do something crazy. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I just don't think I'll ever fit in there. Well, and on that note, let's say you could you could trust at the time that you had some modicum of creative freedom. Were any of those projects that were being kind of dangled in front of you, were you interested or was it not really even that tempting because the movies just weren't that good? Yeah, I should say I never went that far down that trail. Like people were talking to me and they're like, hey, we're interested in you doing this or that. And and I, I wasn't like, OK, let's talk about it and wait for an offer to come in and say no. I've done that with other things. But uh, with the movies, I didn't even get that far. I was like, oh, you know, I'm flattered that you're talking to me. Quite a while ago, Robert Rodriguez was talking to me about directing something. And it was a fun project. And, and like I said, they never actually offered it to me because I never even got that far before I said, I don't think that I'm the guy for this, but uh, that's one of the ones that I was like, I should have gone down that trail because uh, he makes things that are fun and still have some meaning, you know? And so I was like, that would have been a fun one if that could have been a paycheck and just an awesome experience. 
but again, I think that I don't know that that times are going to come again, you know? So what you were saying about the cavalry is not coming. That is where I came 100% full circle. The last couple of years, I've kind of had to take a look at my life and my career and be like, what am I not seeing right? Because I know it seems like it was like 80% I was doing right because I was having good things happen, but some 20% I wasn't seeing clearly. And it seemed like it was somehow making nothing work. In 2007, when I'm with my friends with nothing going on, we're all a bunch of losers, most of us essentially homeless, but we have a camera, right? Being like, you know what? We have to do this ourselves. Nothing had ever worked in my life until one day I said, I'm going to do this thing and take what was available to me, like in my real world resources I actually had, uh, which is what we used to make bellflower. And then that worked. And instead of being like, hey, that was a big life lesson, that worked. We're like, okay, now let's go back to holding our hands out and being like, will someone give us some money and help us? What the hell was I doing? 10 years later, after all that stuff happened, coming back to that being like, well, if I care at all about telling stories in these movies that I say I care so much about, that I'm willing to endlessly work and go to meetings for seven years with no outcome, I should just go back in with the resources I have now. And the second that I made that decision, all of a sudden everything turned around. And like, it was like the stars aligned. And I said, okay, we're gonna make this with whatever we have. I started a Patreon to just somehow have some like small amount of money flowing in and launched it specifically stated goal to produce this film told my friends, anybody who wants anything they want to contribute, I'll take it. We'll just figure it out how to make this movie. And then as soon as we did that, all of a sudden, because we decided to do it ourselves, all of a sudden, all those people, not all of them, but people that I had recently met with and gotten no's from suddenly my phone's ringing. And they're like, oh, I know you got a no, but now that you're going and all the stuff you're doing online seems exciting. Now we want to say yes. When Coat Wolf announced their plans to stop waiting for funding and start working on Canary in earnest, the Rousseau Brothers production company, Agbo, offered to fully fund the production. That's the route we ended up going. Like, I feel grateful to, to get an experience of having a film get funded. It was the first time. This idea that you just have to start is so powerful, I think, because we've been talking to so many people and we've been hearing that over and over again. Like, there's just something to start it. Yeah. When the momentum is there, then people come out of the woodwork. Even if you forget about raising money, I mean, you know, I'd had that script for Bellflower since I was 22 or 23. And I knew I wanted to make it, I just didn't know how. So when I said, all right, I'm going to make this, it felt like the last thing that was really on track in my life, had no idea how we were going to do it. Like, you know, we didn't have money to do it. We didn't have locations. We didn't know who a lot of the actors were going to be. We didn't know some of the things I'd written into the script, like the flamethrower and the Medusa car. I was like, I don't own some old muscle car. Like, wh where is this going to come from? Just the act of saying we're going to start, you see it to start to snowball. I know from the day we said we're going to do it, it was like, you just see things start to fall in place. Like all I did was I called any friends I had, even who were a little bit extended outside my group, who I knew were also aspiring filmmakers. We decided we're gonna make our first feature. Like, do you guys wanna meet and talk about like, do you wanna be involved? Or I have no idea what that looks like. And we had like our first meeting ever, like meeting. Like, <laughs> and we just met at a dive bar here in Ventura. And uh, we're there talking and we're like, all right, so well, what do we do? Like, these, like we need these locations. There's these two main locations that are these apartments that the characters live in. That was a big thing. And I don't think we made any progress at all. But while we were there, we met other people that we didn't know. And they were like, who are you? We're like, well, we're having a meeting to make a movie. And they're like, really? I want to know about that. By the end of that night, we had those two locations from people that we'd met at the bar. Amazing. It was like, they're like, they're like, come, they're, they're like, come, come to our house and hang out after the bar closes. And we went there and we're like, wait a minute, you're, house is like well, the one we're looking for and they're like you could use it and i'm like are you sure this means we might be in and out of here for years and, and they're like i don't care that sounds like fun and so all of a sudden the snowball starts you know just because we said we're doing it and made up a fake start date that we didn't even make i've seen some other people go through this process before and it's actually it's like sort of life affirming in a way having seen a couple other people push through their fear and actually start a project like that with nothing and you always see it like it's like i think most of us we like to work on collaborative things you like to be involved in a project with other people and it's like people are attracted to it yeah i mean i i haven't thought about this in a while but i do i do I did realize at one point looking at my life and i'm like oh my god almost my entire life like most of the people that i care about that are a big part of my life i met them because i decided to turn a camera on one day and uh even that none of us on that whole team had ever been on a film set we're all completely trained on our own just by doing it. But it works. It, it, it works because maybe you don't know the lingo and the jargon, but you figure it out. With having like the Russo brothers come on, do you feel like you can be 100% true to what is most important to you and what you're creating? We came into their thing under a very specific agreement. They very quickly were like, all right, I can tell you guys have your own thing. You have your own crew and we just want to help you. I imagine they'll give us notes when we get to the very end probably, but like... 
they were basically like, we're not going to have meetings with you about story, about development, about any of this stuff. We're just going to, you know, fund your thing and let you guys do what you do. And at this point, that that is exactly what they've done. So I guess I'll have to report back if at the end they suddenly turn evil and they're like, all right, now take all the most important parts of your movie out, you know. But any difficulties or learning lessons from working with them haven't been about that. It's been more just about like scheduling and understanding that we're spending someone else's money and a lot of things that are new for us. So they bring up different stresses. More after the break. Ever since that Bellflower Sundance thing happened, a lot of people, you know, even this many years out, I mean, I have, I have two films that are almost done, but you know, it's been nine years since I've released a film. And still people, almost like you guys, you know, reach out to me about things that we've done in the past. And a lot of it is young filmmakers being like, I want to make this movie, I have a script or I have an idea. And they're, you know, either asking for advice or help. If I take the time to read someone's script and talk to them, I'm like, you literally have like zero in your way. It's only you. People, they want money, they want, resources because they, they just want to put polish over the screen. They're like, your story is your story. You could tell it. You could like get your mom to play the mom and you could get your friend, you know, to play the bartender and you can have these people say the lines and you can tell your story, but you're scared of having your story be there bare naked on the screen without the polish of millions of Hollywood dollars and skill. You know, I feel like 99% of people who reach out to me, I just say the same thing. I'm like, dude, you just need to get over your fear and just go. Like, do you have rich family? Do you have rich friends? No. Okay you're in with most the rest of us, just go. Nothing's gonna happen if you don't go. You gotta be willing to make something and have it not be perfect. The worst thing that could happen is you have a movie that you learn something from and probably leave you much better off than before you went in, at least in your ability to make something. And this is somewhat of a tangent, but the first time I talked to Evan, I mentioned that I made a feature right out of college that I ultimately wasn't happy with. And he said he has a theory about that, which I think is interesting. I'm, I'm not above making uh, uh, theories. I did. I remember I had noticed that when I was editing Bellflower in the kind of the last year, and it was really at that point, mostly me by myself. And I was watching a lot of movies and I started to notice a pattern that like almost any filmmaker that I liked or were interested by their movies, they never finished it before they were 29, I think. Which means, you know, they could have started it at 26, 27, but they didn't finish before 29. A movie that seems like it has value. A anybody who's a movie geek is going to be yelling, what about this person? What about that person? Right. And I'm like, I know there's counterexamples. But I had just had that thought that I was like, I think, you know, to tell this kind of story, it, it gets to a certain level of, I don't know if it's maturity or understanding of the world or understanding of yourself. It's complicated stuff, you know? It was something that I just was always fascinated by because it's a pattern that I've kind of still been noticing. Like people have their first movie, it doesn't really happen before 29. And my speculation was that people that we do know their names who had a movie that was good before that might have had someone helping them a little bit, you know? Mm. Uh, but I don't know. I don't have any reason to say that. Maybe it's just to make myself feel better that I wasn't together enough till I was 29. <laughs> I'll add that a lot of the greats made crappy films in their early 20s, including Jim Cummings. I made a 73-minute movie that was just relatively boring. And after that, I was like, I'm just a terrible filmmaker. I'll never, I'll never make it. And the Duplass brothers. We spent $65,000 on this movie, and it was a steaming pile of dog diarrhea. So if you're hesitant to start making your movie with whatever you have available because you tried before and failed, or because you're worried you'll make a piece of junk, or because you're just worried you're getting too old, just keep that in mind. Can you tell us a little bit about this uh, studio you want to start up? Yeah, I mean, so this is where this thinking has gone. And this is uh, this is very recent now, is that feeling like I had a brutal decade of learning the hard way that even after having a significant like critical success, that it, it didn't really open up the doors that I wanted opened in the industry, in Hollywood, however you want to look at it. And so at this point, I have had one film funded by someone in Hollywood, and that has opened up, you know, that that is, I've now learned about a whole bunch of different challenges that come when you've got investors and partners. And like I said, I've been genuinely, extraordinarily grateful to go through that experience. But um, at least from where I'm standing right now, whether you want to call me crazy, I care about these movies like I do. I think I think stories are something so important. They're one of the things that helps heal the world. It's what helps us understand each other and grow emotionally. And having genuine, honest stories that don't really have any strings attached to them as far as, oh, that's too intense a subject matter. 
or that's going to maybe hurt our marketability or whatever it is. You're like, no, no, no. You have to tell a story about what it is the best that you can with no compromise. And I know that's only one way to do it, but that's sort of how I've lived my life. And so looking at kind of these, all these experiences I've been through in the last 20 years, I'm like a mini studio, but like actually fully a mini studio where you're, you're you know, hopefully financing, developing, producing, shooting, and distributing films is kind of the, where my mind is, you know, and I can't do that on Canary because, you know, it's already been sold to someone else. But when I'm looking at everything else I want to do, I'm kind of like, instead of saying, I think this script deserves, you know, Brad Pitt and $5 million, what justifies it? I'm like, where did you get those fucking numbers? It's just a story. You're telling me your stories with $5 million. I don't think it is at this point. I would rather put a movie out and release it myself and then see how much money comes back and be like, that is going to be your actual indicator of what your next project is worth and what could or should be spent on it. It's like I discovered capitalism for the first time, but the good part of capitalism, maybe not the gnarly extreme part of capitalism. It's like supply and demand. I got out our contracts from Sundance with Oscilloscope who distributed Bellflower and from the other distributors that we all know the names of that made offers. And I looked at the terms and I was like, I didn't care about money during this time period. I don't even know how closely I looked at this contract, you know, but the way they're structured is really insane. Like it is very exploitative. When they tell you we're going to split profit 70, 30, which could be in your favor or their favor, but either one doesn't sound that bad, but what you don't, if you look closer, your profit has been cut in half, like three times before it even theoretically could get to that profit. And this year, when I looked at that, I was kind of like, I've been living a lie because when all that stuff happened with Bellflower and I was like the new hot guy in town for a moment, right? My only option was to take jobs with other people, you know? Like if I was gonna take a, a big budget film where I would take like a paycheck home just for directing, essentially getting my foot in the door and becoming part of the system, that was the only way that I was ever gonna make a living. Thinking that I could go back and do again what we did on Bellflower and independently finance and produce a film and go to a festival and hope it goes well and hope we get a good deal, Looking at all those numbers, I'm like, that is, it is a lie. That is, it is because of that system, I think, why people say filmmaking is the most expensive hobby. And it really shouldn't be. Because at the end of the day, you're like, hey, if you find someone who just believes in what you do and they're willing to lose money or maybe on a good day break even and on a rare day make a little money, you know, then maybe you can continue to do your artwork or your films. I know this is an oversimplification, but um, anybody can just put their movie on iTunes, Amazon. That you don't have to even talk to anybody. Like all of these, what do they call them? Transactional platforms, right? And I'm like, so at least while the theaters are shut down, what's the difference between me and my friends and an independent distribution company? Like we know our film better than they do. We know our audience better than they do. And we can make a few mistakes and miss some windows to monetize something. But at the end of the day, there's not a whole lot of difference. Let's just take out all these weird middlemen, which are really leftovers from before the internet worked correctly. I'll be totally fine admitting that I'm wrong if I just like to tank my company and my whole career doing this. But it's the first honest thing that feels right that I've seen. If you really believe in your films that you're willing to work on them for 10 years, even if you don't do a perfect marketing job and people are responding to them, they'll make their way around. And then money that is made will actually come back to pay all of us who are working on them and could possibly go into the next one. Again, that's just one element of kind of where my mind is going, but I am so excited about it. When you look at it from that angle, things aren't confusing anymore. We've documented everything we've done over here. Just because it's just because a lot of things, you know, when we're working on movies, weird ideas come up and we're blowing things up and we're playing with weird stuff. And, and you know, we kind of document it. And we've always wanted to make a, a documentary about our experience of all of us meeting each other and making Bellflower and going to Sundance and what a wild ride that was. Because I think it's a very interesting story because especially if you actually see what was happening. And we've been talking about this for 10 years being like, man, I wish there was a reason to do that because I really want to make it. Like, it just seems like it would be an interesting thing to share. But if I sit here and I spend months putting together a documentary, interviewing all my friends, then you're like, what are you going to do with it? And I'm like, well, I'm going to have to submit it to all the festivals. And then if it goes there and it goes well, I'm going to have to sell it. And then who knows, I might get dragged around again for six months to a year promoting it. And you're like, it's not worth it. Go back to your movies. But if you're talking about kind of saying, you know what, let's not wait for help from the outside. Let's just do it all here. It sort of seems like the world's set up for it now. Then something like making a documentary like that might be two months of my time that people want to see that also could bring in money because we can just make it available. And then and when you start looking at it like that, for me at least, all of a sudden the the dream starts to make sense again. Oh, here, wait, are we are we off the record now? We can NB. Okay. I mean, not that it really matters. I just was gonna show you guys some, but it's not a secret. I don't know why I asked that, but um, <laughs> but this here, this right here, 
this is a current project. This is a 3D printer farm that we're building. It's going to probably be on in the next week or so. It's a big oven oh because it has to be heated for the material we're using. We're going to start with a handful of printers. And if it goes well, it's going to hold, I think, 16. Wow. And, That's awesome. <laughs> um, and the whole reason that we're building this is this idea of like a boutique or like micro studio where you handle everything. I'm like, well, if the big studios are, are putting toys in Burger King and cups at 7-Eleven, I would, I would like us to be making something that people actually want. Like this? And so, yep, like that right okay. there. I'm learning that movies are hard to just make money off of. That's it. Movies like yeah. art, it's about how much advertising and merchandising you can stick onto a movie. That's where the money really is. Not that I'm, we're there to like make money, but it's like we want to figure out sustainability too. Yeah, and that's what, and that's what it is because the same thing how I I'd actively neglected money. And then recently I was like, okay, this slows us down too much. I have to take it seriously. It's got to be figured out. Like if, if every movie you had to start completely from scratch when you got to the end, you know, you could eat up so much time. I'm going into this blind. I have no idea what's going to happen. But it's the same kind of thinking about being like, well, what is stuff that we would want to do that doesn't exploit our audience? Things we would want to make and we would want to have. If you, if you work on a movie for 10 years in earnest, it kind of just justifies a handful of things coming out with it explaining what it is and an alternate version of it and and maybe some cool collectible stuff and the hope is that if we fig figure that out maybe it becomes sustainable when you look at the big picture it's like there's room enough for there to be lots of what we're doing because basically the real people we're competing with are festivals that aren't offering anything to their way yeah, yeah or just hollywood you yeah. know this yeah, machine the hollywood system that's not like really yeah. like working as best as it could so like what you're doing what jim's doing he has a short to feature lab you're all like uh -huh. patriots with us i feel the same way from where i'm sitting i'm like every time i've collaborated with people or talked to other people who are doing similar things usually only good things have come out of it if people like you guys and me are competing with each other the world's fucked anyway right. you might as well just give up now <laughs> like, right. you know, like, like i don't care about the big five studios but you motherfucker, like, <laughs> like <laughs> We, we just gotta have this sense like, you know, with you and Jim and we talked to Jim recently and just all kinds of people, if you dig into people who came up making movies in the last 10, 20 years, they all kind of sort of tell the same story. They all go through the same kind of ringer, most of them, and then come out going like, you just need to do it yourself, but they're still kind of islands. Everyone's kind of figuring it all out. They're learning lessons the hard way themselves and then setting up their own thing. And at some point I feel like, I don't know, maybe there's like some converging that could happen in the near future kind of loose confederation of people with like-minded people, you know, doing totally different things. Um, yeah, every time you're starting a new project, it makes so much sense for all of us, independent producers, filmmakers, whatever you want to call us, we should always be shuttling people back and forth, helping out, totally. like, yeah. you know. You can follow Coat Wolf on social media to stay up to date on news about Canary, Chuck Hank and the San Diego Twins, and other future projects. I don't want to wait for anybody ever again, and it doesn't seem like it'll ever be productive. If someone's like, hey, I'll give you $1,000 to make the thing you care about right now, or you can wait till two years from now, I'll give you a million dollars. Dude, you take the $1,000. Go with what you have and you make it work, and everything always leads to the next thing. I feel like that's a lesson I've learned so many times, and I'm gonna be very upset if I forget it. Demystified is a production of Studio Fest. If you're ready to make a micro-budget feature, submit your film or screenplay now at filmfreeway.com slash studiofest. Demystified is a Studio Fest production presented by Movie Maker. This episode was narrated and edited by me, Jake Bowen. It was conceived and recorded by Jess Jacklin, Charles Beale, and Jake Bowen. The theme song was composed by Patrick Patrikios. Other tracks used under Creative Commons licenses. To hear future episodes of Demystified, go to moviemaker.com or visit studiofest.com, where you can also learn more about Studio Fest and subscribe to the show.